All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, to another session of Lens with Advanced Design. Today, our guests are Nami Berglund and Jeff Henderson. And so we're very excited to have them here. Um, and thank you for those who are tuning in from around the, the world to watch Lens this morning. Um, a little bit about our guest is uh, Nami Berglund is a curator at Behance, which is a company uh, under Adobe. After spending two decades uh, as a VFX producer and a strategic planner in Tokyo, she moved to New York in 2010. Nami is an art collector, sneaker and streetwear aficionado and a film buff. And a little bit about our other guest, Jeff, with an engineering degree from Georgia Tech. Jeffrey Allen Henderson led product design teams at Nike for 15 years, running Nike Sportswear, Tokyo Design Studio. He founded And Them in 2006 to assist on projects for his friends. And in 2014, things got real and the conversation went from Converse, Converse to Yeezy. <laughs> Just a reminder to please wear a mask. Today, a balanced portfolio of branding and product projects while sharing knowledge with all creatives that are good things. And I think I can definitely confident, uh, I can definitely say that, uh, you know, I'm also a street, you know, um, a sneakerhead. So very excited to have you both here on Lens and thank you so much for your time. We're very excited to hear from you both and have this amazing conversation on this amazing conversation and um, you know thinking bigger and learning from our mistakes. So what I'm going to do now is uh, give the floor over to Jeff, and then we'll go from there. Well, thank you. Um, this is uh, very cool to be invited uh, to these conversations. I'm definitely big. I go back and forth about how I feel about education, but I think the way you're approaching it, Hector, is like a very cool process. And, um, I wish there was something like this uh, when I was growing up, but then I wouldn't have the opportunity to tell you about all my mistakes. Uh, so here we go. And I brought in um, Nami, uh, who has been uh, gracious enough to join us because I tend to just go on her 100 miles per hour and not stop. So she's sort of a person who will stop me and ask the questions because <laughs> I think her background, um, especially in the world of um, portfolios, creatives, like I didn't go through that because again, here to talk about my mistakes. Uh, so I missed a lot of that. So a lot of the way I learned and process design is more of picking up bits and pieces from my other worlds um, and then trying to articulate in a way that typically for designers, like it doesn't necessarily all make sense, but for people who are, I think, just getting into design, it's sort of like, a raw piece of information that they can work with a lot easier. So I'll go straight into, uh, unless anybody's got questions already, uh, I'm usually <laughs> stopping me about right now. <laughs> uh, but I'll throw in um, this not so brief presentation of what I do or how I got to be where I am. Should be up in a, oh good. Oops, let's take a step back. So the idea, I think when Hector first reached out, is like, what would you like to talk about? And typically I have no real point of view. I'm just sort of like, oh, I can just start talking and something will come out. Um, but I need to be a little more focused, I think, as this conversation came out, I think, to help people. So one of the things that I think talk about a lot is that my plans to go forth are usually wrought with error and missing certain pieces. I think no one will outwork me, but I definitely, I've tended to miss out on, I think, certain direction other people gave me that I really wasn't listening to. So this is sort of my take on helping people um, not make the mistakes I made. So I think the first piece that I know I know I feel a lot happens with people is that when you become a designer or engineer or anything else, I think a lot of it is looking under the hood. And if I didn't really have, I think I had a family who sort of tore things apart, but I wasn't really, I think I was encouraged to, but I never had any real interest. I uh, played with Legos, um, touched some things, but there was no real like point of view where I would tear things apart. Uh, and I had like most people, the fear of like, well, if you write on something or if you scratch something, then you know, you, you've ruined it. And so I think a lot of what I encourage people to do all over is to just take stuff apart, break stuff. And a lot of that comes from sort of, and hopefully this doesn't uh, 
blind anybody while they're watching, but the idea, like, this is how I sort of process things, like, on, on and on. As well, I was in high school in the 1980s, um, middle school, actually, when Jordan 1 came out and everybody was into sneakers and I got sneakers and everybody was into certain shoes and my favorite shoe was the Dunk. Um, Michael Jordan became a thing and everybody was after Jordans and I kind of really didn't care about Jordans. Like it just wasn't an interest of mine. And then a music video came on, Boogie Down Productions, my philosophy, and KRS One was standing in front of a Jeep wearing Jordan threes. And at that point, like I just had to have that shoe. It just everything about it. Like I I don't think there was no dunk contest at that point. It was just guy who I listened to the music wearing these shoes and I had not seen them before and they didn't have a swoosh on the side and I was wondering where I could get them. So I go to my guy Full Locker and immediately make a purchase. And the big thing about it is it had like an airbag, visible air. And so I didn't know what that was and I didn't really believe it. So I took a pin and I stuck it in the side of the bag. And I listened and I heard And at that point, like that was the first time like I sort of broke the, what is it, the fourth wall of like, oh, something else is happening on the other side. And so then I kind of had to know, like, who does this? How does this work? How does this conversation happen? Because I was always drawing. I think at that point I was drawing on desk religiously. Um, but I had never sort of thought about design or engineering in a way that sort of was these sneakers that I'm buying left and right. They actually have something. So I encourage everybody, like, break stuff open. Um, the next part of my story uh, is definitely one of those pieces where I really encourage people to tell people what your dreams are, tell people what your goals are, like your actual goal. Um, a lot of people are like, well, I want to go to this school. That's not your actual goal. I think your goal is to go to a school and become some job or do something or save the world or become Spider-Man, whatever it is you want to be. I think making sure people understand what it is, because a lot of times you tell people what the path is as opposed to telling them what the destination you want to reach. And I think that's the part where I've learned a lot to kind of do that because as I started tearing up shoes and falling in love with shoes, one of the things that happened was I actually got a trip to Purdue university right down the street from Chicago um, to go to this engineering um, two week camp uh, minority introduction to engineering. And this was at the end of my junior year. I really had no plans, no thoughts back then. There was no internet to tell me I want to design shoes. I should go be an industrial designer. Nothing. So I really didn't have a focus. So I go to this engineering camp. And at this camp, the first week, I don't really pay attention at all. I'm just playing basketball, enjoying like what's going on. And then somebody says in the second week, Nike was here the other week and they make sneakers. And I was like, well, stop. Like I stopped the entire class. I was rude. I don't know what they were talking about. I didn't know the professor up front in the physics building said Nike was here the other week. The engineers, they make shoes. And I was like, cool. I decided right then and there, I'm going to Purdue, I'm going to design it, I'm going to design a Nike, and that was it. Um, when I got to Purdue, because I actually that was pretty much the only application I filled out, um, I showed up, went to the engineering de uh, department, and they said, Well, the other thing you can have is a co-op job. And if you have a co-op job, it means the first people to get straight A's, they get their first choice. And I was like, well, no one's gonna take this Nike job away from me. So I'm going to get straight A's. So I was one of 10 people out of the, I believe it was 1600 incoming freshmen who got straight A's. And we go meet with the picture of the nice smiling guy there is Professor Keith Hawks. He was head of the co-op student program at Purdue um, right there. I say to him, I'm ready to go work at Nike. And he looked at me like with the strange face of like, Nike's not on our list. And I was like, what do you mean Nike's not on the list? The guy told me and he was like, what guy? 18 months prior, some random guy in a classroom while I was taking a summer camp told me Nike. Like, I had never said out loud, this is why I'm here. If I had, I probably wouldn't have gone to engineering. I probably would have gone to design school. Like everything about that entire 18 months was like a blur in that moment. What I ended up doing was he slid me the book of potential school, potential uh, places I could work and in an alphabetical order, AT&T was first. I picked AT&T. Um, luckily, when I got there, after my first job, I said, I want to be a designer, not an engineer. They actually found me a design office. Uh, I was in Indianapolis. They found me one designer at AT&T who worked in Jersey, and I worked for him doing 3D for four sessions. Um, and it just changed my entire outlook about what I was supposed to be doing because I was going through engineering and I would have graduated 
an engineering degree not being able to do what I love. Jeff. Um, and, yeah. What was the first um, software that Ooh. you got? The first software, strangely enough, it was in 3D. I had not ever worked in 2D of any design programs. I was using Silicon Graphics. I was using Alias, Alias Wavefront, which I don't even know if they exist anymore. That was a very expensive machine back then. <laughs> it was. And so you see these um, look, I don't know, they look pretty ancient uh, 3D renderings. That was done in Alias, and it probably took me, I don't know, half the summer to do those on the side. Yeah. Um, How did you get your hands on? Uh, that's what that's what AT&T was using. So a, this one cool. designer had he had four uh, workstations. He had 3D printer and he had access to whatever he wanted. And they just let him make whatever. He was spending millions of dollars a year just creating his 3D printing and 3D graphics was relatively new. And even while I was there, uh, that's the other thing like in this conversation is that I when I was at school, I worked at Champs, Barnes and Nobles, and The Gap when I wasn't at school. Like I was always working. And some of that was because I wanted the money. I didn't necessarily need the money, but I definitely wanted the money. But I was also trying to learn all the pieces about sneakers and everything else you could imagine. So even when I was co-oping at at t Monday through Friday as an intern on uh, Saturday and Sunday, I would work at, I think my last one ended up being I was at Champs the whole time. Um, but it was definitely, I stayed late after work, Monday through Friday, drawing sneakers in 3D the best I could. Um, had nothing to do with at t but they were like, enjoy. But it also told them I was never going to work here full time. I had uh, this other passion that I needed to chase. Um, and that was to me, the showing your work allows you to sort of create, I don't know, these projects that let people know where you really want to go, even if they make something else. Did uh, you use like a sketchbook? to jot down your ideas of no. like, because you, you're touching shoes every day at mm. the store. And did you like make some sketches of like other no. sneakers? No, no. I mm -hmm. never, I think I probably before I got a job in design sketching on paper sneakers, I probably had done it like 10 times. Like I just never thought, I never understood. I was in engineering classes. And so I learned early on, I needed to take some design classes. So I took some and they were teaching me some basic shading or life drawing or things like that. And I kind of lost interest. And so it wasn't until I got to play in 3D, which is really quite odd. Like I would draw sketches and t-shirts and do graphics for people, but I would kind of just draw on a sheet of paper. It was never shoes, like just never. Um, and even during that run, I even applied for jobs at Nike. And got, that's my uh, rejection letter that I think most Nike employees kind of are proud to show their first uh, Nike rejection letter. So that's what that is. Um, what was rejection like? How did was, you, yeah, how did you t take rejections? Because rejections are often very hard on an hmm. individual because, um, well, like if I got a rejection letter, I would say, oh, damn, like I didn't make it and I'm not good <laughs> enough. And that's the, the feeling that you get when, when uh, there's like a very formal re rejection letter from yeah. like a corporate entity. So what, does yeah. it, what, what did it mean to you? What's funny is I think I probably always process things through the first time, kind of the first time things happen is that I got cut from my middle school basketball team in seventh and eighth grade and thought I could play, thought I could do everything. And I got cut from the team both times. And I was really discouraged. And I was 12, 13 at the time, really discouraged. And then freshman year, I made JV and played a little varsity. I watched other people get cut. And the guy who used to get cut didn't get cut. The difference was I played basketball all summer with people who could really play. And I also grew five inches. So the combination sort of helped me sort of get to the point where I got better. But I think I always approach things from if you get rejected, there's a reason. And then it's a problem for you to solve. And I think I always had the thought of, well, rejection is just someone telling me that I hadn't solved the problem correctly. So it's either if it's worth it, maybe I keep trying and keep trying. But if it's not, then I stop trying. But I, I don't know that I've had a lot of rejections that hurt 
terribly. And when they did, it was because I didn't know, or I thought I knew the solution and I didn't for whatever reason. Yeah, because back in our days, it, it wasn't like um, we had LinkedIn or social media <laughs> to reach out to like other people. Um, it, it must have been a very lonely process or did you share it with um, like your friends, family, and oh, yeah. um, who supported you, like teachers, professors? I think um, it was very much, a, and it was also what I kind of tell people is like, I mean, it's the old thing of like, aim for the moon and you'll reach the stars or something like that, is that I was applying for design at Nike with no design background whatsoever. And so it wasn't a surprise to me or most other people, and it was just a shot in the dark. I think what ended up happening is because I, again, shared that with professors, I shared that with friends, they would give me advice, most of which, and again, you can imagine the time, there was no LinkedIn. Nobody was connected to a place even remotely close to that. Um, the best opportunity I had was I went to Stanford's graduate design school after I graduated with a degree from Georgia Tech in engineering and said, I want to design and I want to come here for graduate school because I think you can help me get to where I want to get to. Again, I didn't tell him my destination. I told him my path. I was like, this is the best way. And he was excited about it. Um, I think it was Dr. David Kelly. Uh, it was sort of like, at first, like, I don't know, do you fit the bill? And I told him, well, I'd already worked at AT&T for two years. I'd already done these things that told him I didn't want to be an engineer. I wanted to be inside. And he was sort of like, oh, okay. Like, I understand. I can appreciate this. And then sometime towards the end of the conversation, what I thought was the end of the conversation, he said, well, what are you going to do when you design? Like, what are you into? Because I had no real portfolio of drawing things. I was like, I want to design shoes. And he stopped. And he was like, oh, okay. Um, I'll be right back. He got up, walked away, came back from the printer, and handed me a list of 10 names of people who had gone through his program and worked in sneaker companies. And he told me most people who had gone through uh, – who had come to that school didn't know what they wanted to do he was like you know what you want to do go do that to which i was like but i came here because i can't get into those places so that was probably one of the most discouraging moments like i ever had because it was sort of like no i'm going down this path um but he was sort of right and so once i like put all my energy in okay i'm just going to go work at a shoe company the reality is those 10 names he gave me none of them worked out because i didn't have a real portfolio to get into any of those places as a designer. Um, but here is where I think I got lucky is that because I had gone through showing people everything, um, I'd gone to AT&T with sort of an engineering frame of mind and found my way into design. I sort of lucked into a conversation that got me into Beaverton when they were hiring a bunch of people to do something that was a little short of an engineering job, it was just doing blueprints. Um, a job that most people who, when they take the job at Nike, they sort of had maybe a two year vocational study and like doing blueprints. And I had an engineering degree and I was like, okay, that's my end. That'll get me to Beaverton, I'll figure it out from there. And the reality is I sort of did. And so I think what really became my 14 years at Nike was literally just walking around, going to people's desks, asking them what they do, and understanding how it is they do it, why they do it. And it was a combination of learning the design portion and then learning the corporate portion, which are two completely different things. They're just two conversations that don't always mix, um, but you kind of have to do it if you're at a big organization like that. And I think one of the things that happened early on, I ended up being in the drafting department for three months and I knew it was not enough. And so I went to my boss and quit. I was literally like, this is not what I imagined. I wanted to get design. He looked at me and said, you have an engineering degree. You probably could do more. We didn't fly you out from Atlanta to go be a drafting person. Go figure out what you want to be. And he didn't tell me where I should be an engineer or a developer or a designer. He said, go figure out what you want to be. So I went to other people's desks. I learned uh, Mike Levini, Tinker Hatfield, Bruce Kilgore, Ray Butts. Um, they were the people who sort of like took me under their wings and just said, just do this. And so I did that for about nine months. And the next thing you know, I'm in kids and I'm doing takedowns of shoes and learning from the designers who are doing uh, all the adult shoes. I'm doing all the kids. So I'm learning a lot about the process and I'm learning about how things work. And the biggest thing I got while I was there is when I got to a point where I was frustrated um, and kids and I was in Nike basketball for a second. I had 
um, somebody high up told me to figure out a five year plan. And they were like, and I didn't understand what that meant. I didn't know what I wanted to be in five years. And again, they were like, pick something grandiose and then go chase that by going. And once you leave school, you forget that school is pretty much built on there's a destination. Now build a curriculum to get to that point. That's basically what I did. And so I had this grand plan of I wanted to do everything from a design point of view, from a creative point of view around basketball in New York City. So I spent the next four years doing everything, even though it wasn't my job around design, whether it was, I was in footwear design and basketball doing like the takedowns. And I was busy working with the um, bags department or the socks department, or I spent probably three trips a year going to New York City to go hang out with Ray Butts and see what branding was like in battlegrounds and see how that world worked. Well, four years after that, which I thought was gonna be um, nothing. I went in to quit again because I didn't think it was going anywhere. And they said, you want to go to Japan? To which I was like, um, yeah, I would love to go to Japan. They were like, well, it looks like you've spent your time working on anything and everything. Um, we need that in Japan. We need someone who can work not in Beaverton, someone who can go outside but still connect with everybody here. That's what I've been doing, traveling to New York. Everything that I had done to place myself in New York City basically put me in Japan. And so it was sort of that when I got there, I was already prepared. Everybody knew I was prepared. And it was sort of that step up. And I just treated my job like that. I treated everything with that look five years out and then figure it out and go from there. And so that's sort of, to me, that idea. Of, and I say it like the small scale version of that is I know whenever I have like an interview or client to go see somebody, one of the things I'll do is I'll know it'll be on um, 52nd and 3rd. And I'll go there a week before and walk around and make sure I know where I'm going, make sure I know where the city bike parks or make sure I know where the restaurant is, just so I know. So I'm not going there the first time and I'm completely surprised by how I get there and what happens. So the idea of never doing things for the first time is a little more about try to see, to make sure there's very few variables in what you do so that other people think you just did amazing thing on what is theoretically the first time. Um, so. And excuse all the uh, sirens, it is New York City. Um, and then the last part where I'll stop talking so much, but I guess I'll let the ambulance go by, uh, is the be who you need. So I had a great, I don't know, educational experience because I spent most of my time working because that's what I like to do. I had an amazing run at working at Nike to the point where um, I felt like I belonged. I felt like everything was um, in a good place. I just didn't want to live in Oregon. Like, quite frankly, if I wanted to live in Oregon, I could have been a Nike employee for life, but I just didn't. Um, and they didn't have the runway for me to go somewhere else and know that I could go there and be there. I wanted to move to New York City with the family. So you come to New York, Cole Hahn, Nike sells Cole Hahn, and then I'm sort of free to be whatever I want. And I decide I'm never doing shoes again. And I'm going to go do marketing and branding and all these other creative exploits that I just never seen. I was like, I had devoted this, my life, which was really almost 15 years, but there's more to life. It's like to footwear. I want to go do something else. So I started working with some friends. I had created this and them project um, as just a way to do side projects with people that had nothing to do with shoes. I sort of grew that and it, we created an e-commerce site called Good Things. But three months into like my hiatus from shoes, then people kind of started calling me. Uh, my joke was, if there's 50 people who are really good at designing shoes, um, 49 of them work for companies, and I didn't. So people called me in for the last seven years. I've had chances to work. I went back and did some Converse stuff, which is still Nike. But I was doing Yeezy. I was doing Everlane. I was doing um, Coyo, uh, Under Armour, just anybody who had something interesting and along the way, I just picked up some really good people to kind of build a team around. And now it's kind of where we are. And so what I also realized through that process is that working with people and working at factories is kind of my big deal. So it wasn't so much about not me. You had asked me before, like what inspires me. And like, I, I think it's always difficult to talk to designers in some way because 
it's not about pattern or trend or like I don't see a graphic and think, oh, this is something. I, I don't know that's right or wrong. I don't know that's what other designers do. I just know that if I go into a factory and see like a lot of work being done, I kind of want to make something. If I see a problem that needs to be solved, like someone has trouble running or someone's backpack is always open, like those are the things. It's like I just want to solve problems. And some of that is like my engineering. And some of it is I just want to break things apart and I want to know the engineering about it. At the same time, I yeah, want to work. Of course. Yeah, because, you know, sneakers, uh, sneakers are not just um, aesthetics. It's like the function is um, super important. Mm -hmm. So how would you, you know, convey like your engineering to design? So typically, and it was one of those, I, I think I was really lucky in the fact that when I showed up at Nike, um, the only other person I think at the time who worked in design who had an engineering degree and not a design degree was Bruce Kilgore. And he would often sit and I would show him projects. I'd show other designers projects and sometimes they problem solve and sometimes it was more aesthetics and uh, styling. But when I show him something, he could care less about like stylings or the aesthetics or anything. And I first thought that was kind of strange. And then I would sort of show up with that sort of answer and realize what was probably the thing that had me last longer in my early years because I, again, I had no real design aesthetic. I couldn't draw to save my life. I didn't have any of those skills and I was learning how to do it on a computer at the time when everybody was using pencils and markers. Um, the fact that I was only problem solving, the fact that I was only going, so what happens when you cut? Where do you need protection? Where do you need this to fit? I was only worried about tearing shoes apart and finding out how could you save money? How could you create better fit? that's probably the reason I lasted. And then I watched other designers like Tom Fox and then more of the like advanced um, in innovation designers. I was sort of built for that, but the part that was strange was I kind of did care about the aesthetics. I kind of care how it looked. I kind of care what graphic you used on it because it was a cultural sensitivity that I sort of, I lived in. So I was able to apply it in whatever small way I could and then once I got better at that, like the two worlds just kind of came together. But I definitely lived for the first four years in Nike, basically problem solving. Um, and to this day, I probably get more points on the projects that I make of solving problems. So, solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, the materials of the sneakers have changed over the years? <laughs> So Very how so. did you, yeah, so how did you um, collaborate with some of the material scientists hmm. over the years? No. Yeah, that's, um, I would say, again, Nike is a very good cheat on all of this because what Nike was really good about is it was a large corporation. Large corporations have people who do like the most finite of jobs and they do it at a high level. And so Nike had several materials designers of which you didn't have to create your own material, you just come with the problem and go to the materials designers and they bring you 35 solutions. 20 of them would come from a book and then 15 they'd sort of make up and six months later come back with, I got this from a vendor based on these bikes, what you did. So then I learned to, and this was true about every job from engineering to materials, but specifically with materials, I learned to really appreciate the people who went to school, who went to factories and vendors and took everything from knit to leather to synthetics and figured out how that um, uh, kind of went so that I learned more about how they actually integrated their um, work into my work. And then it was literally just layering over. I, I literally said, I just want this to breathe and also shine. Can we do that? And then watch them go through their magic to the point where, and I'm, because I was fascinated by it, if we went on a, trip and we we're at a factory i'd go they're going to a vendor i'd say can i go to because i just want to see how it's made and see if i can do something different i also realized that they were 10 times better at figuring out what that was than me and i just let them do their job but i like enjoyed watching them figure out how to solve those problems jeff i have a question for you um what advice would you give someone who graduated with an engineering degree and then realized after graduation that their passion is in design for someone who just like yourself? Hmm. Uh, I would say at this point, what's nice is there's enough tutorials on how to use um, the design tools. Because I think the difference between engineering uh, and industrial design 
is a lot about, um, I guess, aesthetics. Because a lot of engineering is solving problems, and so is industrial design when you do it the right way. I think engineering is making sure that everything works perfectly and seamlessly, no fail. Um, design is, it has to look beautiful, um, and the engineer will sort of make sure it doesn't fail and it can be produced a little bit. So they overlap in some way. If you're an engineer, typically the thing that I know I had to work on is that I'd have a solution, but two things were missing. One, I didn't know how to make it beautiful. And so I had to learn from other people to have like an aesthetic eye because people have to fall in love with it. They just can't see something raw that I would have, my engineering brain would have been like, why do people care? But the second part that I think is probably more important that most people don't appreciate, appreciate about, I know I figured it out later and then I watched people who went to design school is that design school teaches you how to communicate and also how to take um, feedback. In engineering school, you do something and it's right or wrong, typically. Like it's either gonna be 30 um, pounds or 38 pounds of pressure. Like it just is what it is. Um, design school, there's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of subjective nature and being able to take that feedback and work it in is important, but you can't get that feedback if you can't visually communicate your idea. And so engineering doesn't teach you those things. And so learning how to use Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop, learning how to hand sketch some ideas, learning to do it, and then learning what are the trends of what people expect, what do they want it to look like first before you go creating something that might be wildly different. You kind of have to know what that wildly different so that's what I'd say I'd focus on if you have an engineering degree, like learn those tools that I think design schools are really good at teaching, like the communication aspect um, and having a thick skin. Right. It, that thick skin is for all the rejections that you get. <laughs> like, like being a designer, I'm sure um, like, you know, people will get like a lot of rejections mm -hmm. and then and then, you know, your, your boss will say, oh my God, like this looks great, but can you do like three more? And then it's like, okay, I did three more. And then he goes back to the first one and says, okay, this one is good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure like as a designer, you have to go through a lot of iterations. So what do you think of um, all of that? Work. But worse than worse than that, I'm like now guilty of doing that with the designers who work with me. Like, yeah, that that's nice. Like, give me five more. Um, but I do understand that there's a level of again back to engineering school. Like, you solve a problem, no matter how you solve it, as long as you got to the final answer, the professor doesn't care. Like, okay, I see you're thinking through how you got to that answer. Now we're done. I think in design because how you get there matters, and what you show up with matters, and I think there's a part where uh, I know a designer who this was someone who was struggling with how subjective the nature of, I think, leadership um, was in terms of design. And I said, well, I understand that, but there's also the reality that the collectives, they all pick. And so I may pick my favorite shoe and someone else may pick their favorite shoes, a design director, and someone else may pick their favorite shoe. But the reality is of 50 designs, we all kind of share the same top four or five and then it becomes if you trust that creative leadership to really have vision if you trust them to really have um some sense of they know what's right then the goal is how do i make them happy because if i make them happy in theory if they've had success i'll make be successful on the outside world i think that's the part that i sort of gathered uh, and the reality is some days it every job i'd draw something and the same thing would happen people like eh, i don't know if that's good and i had paul karen a grouchy senior designer when i was at nike would often say the worst part about the only thing worse than when you put in that great design that's amazing and they say nope it's terrible like go start over and you're upset is that you go draw something else nine times out of ten is better because you now have something a little and if it's not better it means that first one was the best and you were right, but they don't know that until you put everything on mm -hmm. the table. And so that's why that sort of go back in, go make some more designs, put some more, but show your work portion, just gives them a sensibility of like, all right, you're right, this is the right answer. And creatively, that's sort of, you kind of have to give people more than one answer because it's difficult to be like, oh yeah, this first thing, I'll take it, it's perfect, let's just go. You, when you were um, a student, you mentioned that you worked at The Gap and you worked at Champs. 
Um, and these are all retail jobs. And I think there's a kid out there right now who's working a retail job that has really big dreams. Mm. Um, and I've heard multiple stories from, you know, industry leaders that have worked at Full Locker and things like like someone like Dwayne Edwards. And um, mm-hmm. it's, can you tell us a little bit about how we shouldn't underestimate a retail job and what did you learn from working retail, especially in, 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 you know, so, something like champs and gap and things like that. Oh, I think the greatest part about, I mean, there's two sides. One is a simple effort of going there and having a regular job at those places kind of gives you some sense of what the consumer's thinking and how the engagement interact action with not only product, but, the store setup and merchandising and how price affects decision making. I think all those are like pretty standard, I think, helpful um, variables that play into your mind when you're drawing a sketch. Like, oh, I remember uh, a mom came in and she was worried about the shoe for a kid and they didn't lace right. And that was a thing. Like, it sort of helps you sort of gather that. I think almost more than that, which is really scary, is that I think there's a certain layer of information that a brand gives you from a superficial level of here's our advertisement, this is what we want you to believe, we'll follow our social, here's our um, ambassadors, that's one level. But the best way to get a full sort of drink from the Kool-Aid item is to like go work there. And it's not so much about how they treat their employees at the retail level, because I think there's a whole gap between what you get from working on the sales floor to what probably the CEO is doing. But you then get to understand, okay, how are they processing? How are they teaching their retail employees to talk about the product? How do they care about the items that are coming? How often they're coming? And the part that, I mean, I always say, this is kind of horrible, but it is kind of the truth and everybody's used to it, is that if I could have done it all over again, I wouldn't have worked at the same champs or the gap three times in a row. I'd have worked at four different stores. I'd have gone, because then I would have been sampling all right, this is how Champs treats people. This is how they talk. And this is how Foot Locker treats people. This is how they talk. This is how Finish Line. This is how Pottery Barn treats. Like, I would have learned so much more had I sampled all of what those retail giants did and their product and understood the level of, I don't know, interest they had in certain things. And I think to go back, it would have been, oh, yeah, try all those. But I can't speak enough of, like, school was nice, but that was definitely more of a real-world opportunity while I got paid. Um, that sort of is helpful. Yeah, that, that is very, um, yeah, thank you so much. I think a lot of us, since we're consumers, we totally underestimate, you know, have an experience. As, uh, it, it's considered a high school job, right, where you work retail and things like that. But uh, you actually learn a lot. So thank you um, for speaking about that. Um, we do have a question regarding, you know, Nike. And, uh, mm. you know, working at Nike is often considered a dream job for a lot of designers. Um, in the initial stages of working there, did you ever experience a moment of imposter syndrome? And if you did, what, <laughs> what are some insights and advice that you would give to individuals navigating through those feelings and ch- channeling that energy into creating a genuine and meaningful work? Yo, that is wild. Imposter syndrome was probably like every day for me for the longest time. Um, I, again, I walked into a world where I was in Oregon, I was from Ohio via Atlanta, and sort of like, this is not real. And I played basketball every day in the gym for lunch while I was learning to like design shoes. Like it was sort of like, this can't be real or normal. And every now and again, I'd hit this wall of like, oh, you're not good enough to be here. And I would just be like, okay, one person, it was three levels. There would be people who just smile at me and be like, this is cool, but they wouldn't give me a job or a real chance. And then there would be people who'd be like, Like, this ain't cool. Like, literally, you're not good enough. And I would be kind of disgruntled, disheartened, disheartened a little bit. But then I find people like, no, they're right. You're not good enough. Go do these things. And that cycle, like, continued to the point where I started ignoring the people who just smiled at me. It's like, good job. Because sometimes they actually just meant it. And sometimes they just didn't want to have time for me. Whatever. That's not everybody can spend every time with everybody. Um, It's a a competitive uh, company. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Awesome. Some of some of it was they just literally just didn't have time. There was so many people and so much work, like no one had time to take care of everybody. Um, but I actually sought after the people who would look at me and be like, your work's trash. I'd be like, oh, why? Like, tell me more, tell me more, like help me get better. Whether they wanted to or not, I would just constantly go like, oh no, it's good enough, please tell me. The imposter syndrome, what's funny is 
I didn't know what that was or how it was affecting me till I was probably in year seven in design. And I think I was in Japan at the time. And at that point, I had not really executed anything that design stood up and down, stood up in like high five. Uh, there were plenty of projects where I made the company a ton of money and I had done some right things and projects with people. So it was all good, but I hadn't done anything like a note. And then I did this one project and I remember going to Sergio Lozano, who was my boss, and asking him like his thoughts on like the design. And one of my concerns was it looked so different that it wasn't Nike enough. And I was like, you know, I'm just trying to make sure it's Nike enough. And he looked at me with a strange face, um, causal, and he started laughing because he realized that I was still trying to be a Nike designer. He was like, let me explain something to you. You're a Nike designer who people actually trust. You're a Nike designer. Anything you draw as a Nike design, please go away. And I was like, oh, like that was the first moment where I felt like, and to note, Sergio was somebody who I had to convert. Like he was the one who was probably like, yeah, I don't know that he, he never would have said it out loud. If you asked him to today, like, oh, you know, he just was okay. But he probably, but I'm sure, and no, I know it's like he was creative director of running when I started. And I don't think he would have gave my portfolio first, second, third look. Even when I got into kids basketball, it was probably like, I don't understand why he's here. Um, but I think later on, he started to realize, oh, like, there's something here and this guy's not going away. But he's the one who told me like I belonged. And I think that was like a big sort of from then on, like there was no more imposter syndrome. Like, but before that, I think it was definitely like pinching myself. Why am I here? Why are people asking me questions? Why do people think I know what I'm doing? Like there was a little bit of that routine. Um, you just got to pretend like, yeah, I do know what I'm doing. Don't listen to it myself. Yeah, I think a lot of designers, especially when you're in design school and then just recently graduated going into the industry and imposter syndrome is definitely something that you, you live with. And um, I think a lot of it comes with just experience and mm. faith. I think we talked a little bit about failure and even though as much as we all hate failure, I think we need to embrace it and be open to, um, you know, other people telling us how to get better. Um, and, and like Nami said, thick skin and it's not personal. Right. Like when right. they about your work and how to get better, it has nothing to do with you as a character, or as a person and everything to do with about your work. I think one of the things we were just having a conversation with him about one of the designers on our team and it, it just occurred to me. And again, I'm one to kind of critique the school system as it currently sets uh, in so many ways. But one of the thoughts I had was that one of the less than helpful pieces about going to school is that you sign up for a class, you're given a curriculum at the end of that time period, you're given a grade, and then you're sort of done. And even if you fail, the reality is there's no hiccups. In real life, the project you're working on may get, not get funded, your boss may change halfway through. Like every time you do a project or you work on exam, you know that they gave me the project on February 3rd and on April 16th, I'm going to do my final presentation and it's pretty much cut and dry. And I can only imagine if that professor said in May, uh, yeah, we're not doing this. Yeah, we're done. Like nobody gets a grade for it. Like, thanks for working on it. Like now, whatever it is you can draw in your book right now, that's what you're going to get a grade on. Like that seems like the most absurd thing you would do in school. Yet that's how the real world works. And I think that's a part where I don't know how you do that, <laughs> uh, but it's a real sort of skill to understand that these are things that could happen. Yeah. And I think, um, and I think, you know, to what you just mentioned, I think uh, education should start to reflect a little bit of industry that, that, That'd be amazing if I could just go into class and say, stop what you're doing. <laughs> the funding's gone. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. yeah, because that, that, would, um, that would allow students to be ready for anything, to adapt, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, yeah, I wish that students can be in those situations. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean that every project will come to materialize. 
because mm -hmm. there's like so many projects that we talk about, discuss about, and all sorts of like uh, work that we do. But often at times in the real world, um, the projects will get canceled. And even though if you pour your heart and soul into uh, your project, um, maybe uh, there's some circumstance uh, that makes that, that project, um, okay, you know, we, it's taking up so much uh, of our budget, so we have to kind of shelf it, you know, we'll get, get back to it later, but people will never get back to it later, <laughs> most, most times. So I think um, the important bit is to um, keep that project, the rejected project, put it into your portfolio. Share your work. Share, Share your, your work. work. Yep. I think that to me is like, you won't find a talented designer who doesn't have a box under their desk with their, if only this had come out, if only we'd have finished this, like if only we'd have had a better practice, if only I'd have made it red instead of blue, like we'd have gone through that meeting. Like every creative probably has those. And I think it's something that doesn't change. The stakes just get larger or the investment just gets bigger. And uh, our team was talking the other day about sunk costs. Sometimes they'll spend a million dollars creating and developing something like those phones I showed you from AT&T. They spent millions of dollars. They never came out. Like they never came out. Um, wow. Yeah, um, people on Behance, um, they will post rejected projects all the time. And there's nothing wrong about that. It means that you're capable of uh, following up with your projects. So more, you know, more rejection you have, I think it, it just, you know, be a part of you and part of your experience and grow as a designer. And I think um, I tell people all the time that what I'm really good, I may not be good at design, but I'm good at my process. And that the reality is design is more like baseball. Like any designer who everything they do works is probably not trying hard enough with more cha challenging projects because I tell people all the time, I'm really good at creating shoes and I have a 30% chance of being right. Like, but I'm really good. Um, it's just a matter of like, what happens in all the other places and all the other pieces. And hopefully I'm better than 30%. But the reality is like, I've had way more duds and so has every other designer. Like you, whoever you show, they'll show you like the stack of drawings or stack of toolings that got made. And it's like, oops, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Um, but, if you don't try something extra that could scare people or even scare yourself or might not be able to be made, you, you do it uh, when the time is right. But if you're not working on those, you'll never see how far you can push yourself or everybody else around you. Um, can, um, Jeff, can you also talk about the power of collaboration? Mm, collaboration in terms of uh, just partnering with people um, working? Uh, I think, and again, this is more of because I showed up um, with no design skill at Nike and needed to learn that. And probably what I brought more to the table was my engineering background. And the fact that I was doing 3D when this was before people had 3D is that I remember working with Mark Smith on projects and that's all I could do was 3D. And so I would learn from that conversation and he would put stuff on the table and invite me to meetings because I was doing 3D. And I think if you expand on that, even the people you work with in your building, there's a collaboration uh, between designers and engineers, material designers, and marketing. There's collaborations between different companies that one group brings something to the other. And I think a good collaboration is when you're bringing something to the table, pretty much equivalent in skill to someone else, and you're both learning from each other, and then the world sees something new. Uh, I think so often there's like, Oh well, let's do a collab. Let's collaborate of engineering and design. When maybe there doesn't need to be a conversation because they're not really ready. But when you find the right sort of partner to dance with, I think you can make some really good strides if you push them and they push you. Um, you've worked with a lot of people. You work with a lot of different brands. Um, you know, at this time of your life right now, have you? you know, fulfilled your dreams or do you still dream and uh, look forward to working for a brand that you haven't worked at yet? Uh, for me, I think I still have fun working with different brands. I think now like developing 
some of my own projects with some people. I think those are probably, I don't know if they're more fun. I think it's just a different fun. I think the thing that I've probably had more fulfillment over the years, which I didn't think that would be the case. And it's only now that uh, I call it refrigerator art. You know, when your hmm. kids have some really bad drawings and you put it on the refrigerator, not because you like the drawings, because your kid did it and then they do great things. And then you still have that really crappy kindergarten picture on uh, the refrigerator. I know that I kind of felt it as I like brought on maybe not so much really junior designers, but people who are, I was bringing through the system in Nike, that was one thing. But I think watching specifically the two designers, um, Jen Hong and Slade Bembry, watching them sort of blossom into the creators they were and knowing like the stuff they used to present and I still have it. and I still like send them every now and again, like you think it's good, but I still have this. I think the idea of helping create new designers, new creators is actually the thing that sort of gives me the most inspiration. And sometimes that happens at other brands. Sometimes that just happens on projects we're working on. But I think that's probably the biggest thing. That takes more time and energy and effort than like actually doing the project. And so while I still have fun doing those projects, because it's sort of like, yeah, I like riding that bike just as much as anybody else. I spend more of my time teaching other people to kind of ride their own bikes because I think more of what I think I want to see in the world will come about if there's more creators who can like, who feel confident in the work they do. They don't have to be like me. I just want them to feel like they have all the tools they need in their toolbox. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I think the generation now of students and young professionals definitely have all the tools. They have you know, a computer at their fingertip. They have social media. <laughs> They have LinkedIn and they have all of these amazing tools of communication, um, something that didn't exist when you were kind of learning and, you know, going through your journey as a, as a young professional. Yeah, it's true. But I also, I remember being at Nike laughing when I got there, when Mike Avini is telling me they used to, for the, it was, that, no, it was the dunk. They had the facts over the fact that it was a rubber cup sole and they had the, bite line go up two millimeters and then go and that took like three months and a fax to figure out how to make those molds and i go uh that seems like like ancient history but i also know if you looked at my tech packs from like 1997 and saw how the things are you would go well why would you make it like that so i think there's always this sort of spirit of like oh it was uh much harder back then it didn't have access but everybody else was playing by the same rules i think now maybe some of the struggle now with everybody is they're all playing with everything in the toolbox. So it's harder to differentiate who's better because um, everybody seems to be running at 400 miles per hour. They all have access to all the same information. Like I didn't know what an industrial designer is. And today you can go on LinkedIn and connect to the creative director at Nike. Like that's worlds apart, but so can everybody else. So that doesn't necessarily give anybody an advantage. Uh, I think it's to my, I would think it's harder now because there's more people who know, there's more competition. Um, I would have bet there were 50 people who wanted to do the job that I got when I got the job. Now there's probably 50,000 who kind of know the job exists and are trying to get that. So I think it's, yeah. I give credit to the people who are out there playing now, I think it's much harder. Uh, maybe I would give up and just stay working at wherever I was working and call it a day. Yeah, and I, um, you know, even though if there's like so many competitions, like, you know, 50,000 people going for this one job. I mean, don't give up. And um, I think it's important to build up your portfolio because now mm. you can, there's tools like, you know, for example, Behance <laughs> that you can make an account for free and show up your job, like show your job and connect to everybody. And there's a, a audience. There's always mm. an audience with all the social media um, that's available for free. Um, so, uh, the most important thing is to save your projects and maybe you, you might inspire somebody. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think that it's always the final presentation of projects you may have, like the actual process. I think we've seen a lot over the last four years that there's creatives who end up on whether it's different websites or different social media feeds where they've done something different like cutting open shoes and stitching them together and they get a quick, uh, run at Nike or Reebok or a company that's sort of interested in something slightly different, but those skills aren't necessarily 
something that can keep you a job forever by working there. Whereas I think if you're a trade industrial designer um, and you bring that to the table and you can show that through content um, in some way that sort of shows how you get from A to Z, how you think. Uh, I'm always more captivated by how people think. Uh, again, back to the show your work than the actual thing they place on the table. Uh, I tell people all the time, they're like, ooh, you wanna look at my footwear designs? And I go, I look at footwear three hours a day minimum from like people from all over the world who like, none of it, like there's very little that's gonna make you go, ooh, ah. Like I know at Nike, they get so many portfolios that it's not gonna make them go, ooh, ah. But somebody sent me like a vase that turned into, it was a vase that turned into um, like a remote control. And I was like, why do you need that? And they walked me through why I did that. And I was like, oh, like it had never occurred to me that that would be a thing, but it made me think. And I think that's part of, I think the challenge is doing these things and making people think as opposed to putting more of like the same that's already out there, no matter how good it may look. Yeah. Well, we can start wrapping this, uh, you know, lens session up uh, with a couple of questions and then we can kind of end it. Um, one question is, what is your favorite shoe of all time? <laughs> uh, what's funny is that question like always gets asked. My um, textbook answer is the dunk because it's what I played in first and my community became a mentor. Um, the next answer that's always the answer is like whatever I'm drawing next is always the favorite shoe. Um, the reality is I kind of work. One of the reasons um, I like New York City is I don't see shoes for shoes. I see them for, this is scary because I'm old enough that, especially being at Nike, is I see shoes for who designed them or who worked on them. So I'll be on the train and I'll just go Bruce Kilgore, Sean McDowell, um, Jason May. Like I'll just name, I know them. So I know those shoes for who did them. And even the shoes I worked on, like the 350 V2 is as much Benno as it is Kanye. Like that's one of those, and no one may know who Benno is, but I know who Benno is. And, that's why I kind of like the shoe because I spent way too much time sitting next to Benno in fact. Um, so it's one of those, no one can really, I think, understand why I would like something. And I don't even know until like I see it and I go, oh, I remember when Jason May was drawing it and it was terrible. And then look at that sample or Peter Fogg. I had no idea what he was drawing, but I know I want it. Um, so I don't know what favorite shoes are. Yeah, you're, you're definitely a designer. I do that when I go shopping. <laughs> this person designed that exactly exactly and then the last question i wanted to ask you is do you have any advice any parting words for students who are watching who are currently you know learning you have one more time sorry um i think you... nami you got background <laughs> i got background okay sorry okay. let me mute mute that's okay sorry, one more time um yeah you know, we're in a pandemic and we have mm -hmm. students that are always watching Lens and uh, inspired by the designers that we invite on here. Do you have any parting words for them as, as they are going through school and as they're, this is their new reality of education? Mm, I would say, like, again, it's one of those, I think things are just as much as everybody has access to the creative director of name a company, um, Porsche through LinkedIn, everybody else is going through the pandemic. I think if you can settle yourself, because not everybody's going through it in the same way. Um, some people have the privilege to live in certain places and work through certain things. But I think if you can figure out what your sort of level playing field for yourself is and sort of start just creating things that show that your time was spent studying the world around you as opposed to pretending like the world wasn't changing right in front of you. I think projects that sort of speak to whatever the new normal may be or whatever, not necessarily calling it pandemic, because I think there's sort of a, there's a here and now that's happening. There's also change that's gonna happen. And I think if you can constantly work on projects that sort of focus on the optimistic viewpoint of what's out there and problem solving, I think that is a worthwhile conversation because it keeps you, A, optimistic, B, it just keeps you moving. And I can't speak enough about having gaps in your portfolio, whatever that may mean, whether it's jobs or anything else, like I, those scare me um, when I look at a designer because I, I think maybe they got into a rut and I don't even care if you had a job, but if you don't have a job or you don't have school, just go create some more stuff and keep filling that Behance portfolio, keep filling your mental toolbox, keep filling and filling and filling because at some point 
someone's going to call you to do something. And if you're stuck on the same sketch or you're stuck at the same job or you're stuck because you can't get over whatever it is you can't get over, I think part of being creative is getting through those ruts, um, as painful as they may be. Um, that's sort of the nature of like the trade. Yeah, this is the, the time. It's a great time to be um, focused on what you like and you, you have the time to uh, dig further and become a nerd about it. Like, you mm. know, everything like inside out. I mean, if you want to be a sneaker designer for Nike, I mean, you can go from Jordan one through, you know, whatever the, <laughs> the end number was <laughs> and then study e each and every one of the, the models and, you know, know, know your stuff inside out. Yeah. Absolutely, because we, um, as much as I want to think that there isn't going to be another pandemic or whatever that the case may be, I don't know if we're going to have another opportunity where the whole world slows down and we're able to smell the roses and we're able to focus, like Nami said, and nerd out about the details. So um, I highly encourage everyone to do that. Um, but other than that, Nami and Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your insights and your questions. Um, you know, I think your journey is a perfect example of, of, of um, someone who could do anything as long as you have the right attitude and the right mindset, you can accomplish uh, any, you know, you can hit your goals and your dreams. So, um, Jeff, thank you for your time. Thank you for having us on there. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for everybody for showing up. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you at the next lunch session. Have a good afternoon. Bye, everyone.